Happy Sabbath morning here from Centerville, Ohio. Welcome to our home. We're here in the living room. Um, I think there's someone behind me here, and uh, we just thank you for coming. We're doing uh, lesson four, uh, prayer power interceding for others. And before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you guide us in our lesson study of the great power of prayer. The breath of every Christian is prayer to you, and as we come to you praying for others, asking your power to help others, that that will help us too in our walk with you. Be with us this blessed Sabbath morning as we go forward under your power, your majesty, and your grace. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text is confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And in the first paragraph here of Saturday's lesson, it deals with like the process of prayer. And it takes from the text of Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Three stages here. Notice first the disciples prayed. Next, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they spoke the word of God with boldness or confidence. There's a direct relationship between their prayers, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and powerfully proclaiming God's word. As we go to Sunday's lesson, A Cosmic Struggle, let us turn to Revelation 12, verses 7 to 9. We, of course, here on earth are involved in a great controversy, the great controversy between good and evil. And this text tells us where this great controversy began. It basically began, first of all, in the mind of Lucifer, the angel, when he found out he could not be equal to God, equal to Jesus Christ. And so as a result, war broke out in heaven. So Revelation chapter 12 verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great serpent, the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil. And Satan, who deceived the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And so as a result, the great controversy comes to this planet, Earth, a planet in rebellion, a planet where Jesus would have to come down and die for our sins and shed his atoning blood on the cross. And of course, that atoning blood that Jesus shed on the cross, he is now providing for each one of us for our benefit up in heaven at this very moment in the most holy place. Um, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. And Paul talks about this cosmic struggle. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And of course, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places happen when the war in heaven, rebellion, broke out. So we are all a part of this cosmic struggle. And it says here, a sentence here in Sunday's lesson, our prayers unleash the mighty power of God. And Mrs. White in the Great Controversy says, is a part of God's plan to grant us, in answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow, did we not thus ask. There was a prayer of a young Jewish king back in around 970 BC. His name was Solomon. He was ascending the throne after his father David. And of course, Solomon it didn't come easy for him to come to the throne. 
His older brother Adonijah tried to overthrow him. David's favorite general Joab was against him. Uh, and others were in his path. However, Solomon had Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, all of David's mighty men of valor. And in the end, Solomon was able to ascend the throne. The day before his enthronement, he went up to Gibeon to pray. And there, as he, after he prayed and offered sacrifices, the Lord came to him in a dream. And he asked, what would you like me to give you? Think about that if God asked that of you. What would you like me to give you? And Solomon could have chosen many, many things. He could have chosen great riches, a long life, to deal with his enemies who were still around. And yet this young king, probably in his early 20s, does not come with pride, asking in many ways for his own power and wealth and riches and long life. He asks for a discerning heart to know right from wrong. He says, I'm but a little boy. How can I rule over this great a people that you have given me? I ask for you to give me a discerning heart to know right from wrong. And it says the Lord was pleased to hear Solomon make this request. And God said, you know, I will give you the discerning heart. And because you did not ask for great wealth, for a long life, for me to take care of your enemies, I will take care of that for you too. You see, God was surprised and pleased. And so when we pray according to His will, it pleases Him. I mean, God said to Solomon, you can have whatever you want. And God says at the end, He says, and if you follow in my laws and statutes, in the covenant of Israel, you and your generations will continue to be on this throne. And so there with the prayer of a young man, God gave him the wisdom and the discernment as a gift from him. And of course, that's what we now think of Solomon as the wisest man who ever lived. Pray, by praying for others in intercessory prayer, we also pray for ourselves. By lifting others by name before his heavenly throne, that not only helps them, it helps build us a closer relationship with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, up in heaven. Let's go to Monday's lesson. It talks about Jesus, the mighty intercessor, where right now in heaven, Jesus is applying the benefits of his atoning sacrifice for our sins as we offer our prayers to him up in heaven. And he takes his shed blood and applies them to our sins. In Luke chapter 3, verse 21, it says this, and this is at Jesus' baptism. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. After his baptism, Jesus prayed. This is unique to the Gospel of Luke. God opened the heavens, He spoke audibly, and the Holy Spirit came down as a dove. His family was present at His baptism. He also prayed many a times before His miracles. Before He had the feeding of the 5,000, He took the five loaves and the two fishes, and as He put them up, He prayed to God, and of course God gave Him the power to multiply those loaves and fishes to feed probably the 15 to 20,000 men, women, and children there up in the Galilee. And so there was power there. Jesus spent time with his Father in prayer. He would go out early, early, even before daybreak, 
to spend hours in prayer with him. And it tells us if Jesus, the Son of God, needed to spend time with his Father, think of how much we need to as fallen sinful beings. But we can get the power from on high, from prayer, from God, by praying for others and offering up humble prayers for ourselves according to his will. Luke 22, verses 31 to 34, Jesus prays for someone he knows is going to fail. This is Peter at the Last Supper. Luke 22, verses 31 to 34, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times that you know me. Peter prayed, I mean, Jesus prayed for Peter. He knew what was going to happen. This big man of pride was boasting, as all the disciples were boasting, that we would never leave you. We will, that he will, but not me. And if you notice, in Jesus' prayer, he anticipates Peter's failure because he says, I pray, I pray for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, that means after the resurrection, when Peter was a broken man, when he thought he was not worthy to be a, not even one of the disciples, but their leader. Jesus there at the ending of the Gospel of John, takes Peter by the hand and they have that walk on the beach where in a public way in front of seven other disciples, Jesus reinstates Peter once again as head of the disciples in a very beautiful passage. So here, Jesus is praying for him, knowing what's going to happen. But by the prayers of Jesus, Peter did not go the way of Judas when he was crushed. He was able to come back and become the great leader once again. Hebrews 7.25 tells us that Jesus, as our heavenly intercessor, in Hebrews 7.25, what he is de de doing for us today. And it's much different from the human Aaronic priesthood down in the earthly sanctuary. It says here in Hebrews Chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And of course, that will what he is doing now as he is applying the benefits of his atoning sacrifice for each one of us. Let us go to Tuesday's lesson, Paul's intercessory prayers. Going back to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 through 21. Paul knows about this cosmic struggle as he prays for the believers. He knows that now we have an ascendant Christ in the heavens, ruler over heaven and earth. Christ is exalted ruler in this age and the age to come. That gives him confidence that should give us confidence. And so as he prays for the believers in Ephesus there, in Ephesus chapter 1, verses 15 through 21. And there are three specific requests there at the beginning of this prayer that he makes for the Ephesians. Verses 15, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of Him. So that's the first request. That God may give them a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. The second, I pray that the eyes of your heart, that's a beautiful phrase, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened that's the second request. The third, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, 
what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance of the saints, so that they will know the hope of his calling and the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. That's his third. Verse 19, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the workings of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. We pray to an exalted Christ, a triumphant Christ, up in heaven, who defeated Satan at the cross. And through His blood, He can make us clean. Through His blood, He can bring us closer to Him. Through His blood, as we pray, for not only our sins, but to apply His blood for others, or to strengthen others in their walk. There is power in that, because He has triumphed over Satan at the cross. And so we pray to an exultant, triumphant Savior who will be coming very soon to take us home and will exchange our fallen sinful bodies for His glorified sinless body. One of my favorite books of Paul is Philippians. And so as you just turn from Ephesians to Philippians, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 to begin with, it says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy, in my every prayer for you all. I had a, uh, not long after Heidi and I came to one of the four conferences we had been in over our years of ministry, it was the first one we had come to. We were brand new. And the president of that conference took this verse, verses 3 and 4, and he read them and he would put the word of the pastor and he would just say, let's say, George, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you. And then he might send, say something specific that he appreciated about that person's ministry. And he would go all around that room and pray this prayer. And it was a, it was a beautiful thing to see. I mean, we were brand new. Uh, but I've always remembered that, and I've always remembered that was really what Paul was saying. Paul wrote this letter, which is called the Letter of Joy, while he is in a dark prison under a death sentence. He doesn't know whether he will come out to be reunited with the Philippi believers or whether a sentence of death will be passed for him. And of course, Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's not afraid of that. And so he writes this Letter of Joy to this special church of believers that he is very close to. This is not like his relationship with the church in Corinth or out the churches in Galatia. He's very close to these people. And he says in verse 6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He says very confidently that Holy Spirit which has come upon you through prayer will strengthen you on your upward walk, on the trend of your life, the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, which is reignited through prayer, that that upward trend will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, when Christ comes to take us all home. And then verses 9 and 10, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge, and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Again, that upward trend, preparing during this time on earth that our love may abound still more, we'll have knowledge and discernment, we'll focus on the excellent things, and we'll be sincere and blameless. That upward trend the upward call. So as Paul prays for his fellow sufferers, as he would call them in Philippi, his brothers, the people he says, you are going to be a part of my heavenly crown so that I will know that my preaching was not in vain when you come. The prayers he prays 
for his good friends here in Philippi are very powerful. And he says, I pray that you will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit through prayer for the day of Christ's coming. Let's go to Wednesday's lesson. Daniel. And this, this part, this is in Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. Daniel's an old man now. He's in his 80s. This, we believe, takes place around 536 B.C. He's, per Persia has now overcome. Medo-Persia has now conquered Babylon. Daniel has been alive long enough to see the head of gold fall and now to be replaced by the second kingdom, the silver kingdom, Medo, Persia. And there are basically four key prophecies in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2 is, of course, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. That was probably given to Daniel around 603 B.C., not long after he and his friends had went into exile in Babylon. Then you have three visions given specifically to Daniel. Vision of chapter 7, we believe that was given around 554 B.C. He's an old man, and this is when the beasts come out of the sea. Again, the four powers in the same order, only you now have a little horn power. And so that vision was in chapter 7. Then 551, you had what we believe is Daniel chapter 8, dealing with little horns, vertical attack. Uh, on the heavenly sanctuary, and of course the second and third kingdoms fight. No, the uh, yeah, the, yeah, the second and third kingdoms, the ram and the goat uh, fighting, and then little horn once again. That was given in 551 B.C., and then chapter nine, which is a part of that same vision. Daniel had to wait probably around 12 years to get that 539 B.C. So eight and nine while given in different times, are the second vision given to Daniel. And then this final vision, which we think is around 536 B.C. Again, Persia has now replaced Babylon. And this vision basically forms chapter 11. So first vision, chapter 7. Second vision, chapters 8 and 9. The third and final vision, maybe the end of 10 going in to chapter 11. And this is uh, Gabriel coming to Daniel. Daniel, has, Daniel is in prayer. And verses 10 through 14. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. This is Gabriel. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was, was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, Michael is the pre-incarnate Christ, one of the chief princes came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. And of course that vision is the final vision, the third vision given to Daniel. But here we see unseen powers at work. Satan, the prince of the air as Paul calls him, for 21 days prevented Gabriel from coming to Daniel, who was in prayer and fasting. And finally, the pre-incarnate Christ, Michael, prevents Satan from keeping Gabriel, from giving Daniel this final vision for his people. And so, it tells us that God loves Daniel. It also tell, tells us Satan, as the prince of the air, is still at work. He will do anything he can to break us down, to break our faith, to break our hope, to use us as a poison pen to others. But remember, there's a greater power than that that is for us, 
that is in our army, that is our general, and by prayer that keeps us close and can keep us triumphant through him by the machinations and temptations of the Prince of Persia, the Prince of the Air, the Dragon, whatever we want to call him. Thursday's lesson, prayer focus, specificity in prayer. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. Now this is an interesting prayer from Samuel. The people of Israel had asked for a human king, though God did not want them to have one. But they kept saying, we want to be like the other nations. And in the end, God, with a broken heart, gave in to them. He knew Saul was not the proper one. The young Saul knew that too. But here at Gilgal, at this enthronement ceremony for Saul, Samuel, probably with a heavy heart, gets up and makes a prayer for the people. In many ways, it's a remarkable prayer because it's, in some ways it's a prayer of sadness, but it's also a prayer of faith for Samuel. Maybe hoping, hoping something good or maybe something evil will not come from what the people have clamored for. Verses 22 to 24. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord, serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things He has done for you. Samuel prays for the people of Israel there at Gilgal, as Saul is confirmed as king. And he's pleading with God for men and women who really did not follow God's dictates of what he wanted. But he still prayed for them. And of course, this prayer, he's also praying for the young Saul as king. Because even he says, if I don't pray for you, I am sinning against you and I want to pray for you. Because Samuel really is the judge and the priest at that time. He had a unique role. Even Some would even call him a king. And so Samuel is there being very specific and saying, while this was maybe not God's will, I'm a part of this ceremony. I will pray for you, and I will pray for the people, and I'll, of course, pray for the king. 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And this kind of reminds me of, of the young boy, the young man Solomon's prayer. 1 John chapter 5. Verses 14 through 15. This is the confidence which we have before Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from Him. It's kind of like with Solomon. He didn't ask for riches, killing all his enemies, a long life. He asked for discernment, and clearly that idea of, a, of discernment, clearly that idea of his humility also came from God. And so he prayed that prayer, and God was so pleased, he gave him the things he did not pray. So if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, whose requests, have also come from Him. That's an amazing thing. It's like faith and grace. Grace is a gift we receive, and faith is a gift we receive from God to accept that gift. And so as we continue here, I want to read this quote from Mrs. White here at the bottom of Thursday's passage. Satan's whole host trembles at the sound of earnest intercession. 
Ellen G. White describes the power of prayer in these significant words. Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appealed to, for he fears and trembles before his strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. We are not alone. We are not alone in this cosmic battle. We have the power of prayer. We have the power of the one exalted up in the heavenly sanctuary right now. The one who descended, the one who was humiliated on the cross, and the one upward and exalted is with us now. And he has the power over the prince of the air. And remember, not one sincere prayer is ever lost. And then by praying according to his will, we, by his power, can come through this great controversy and be reunited with him in heaven and the new heaven and the new earth. Clyde and I both wish you a happy Sabbath day and God bless you as we pray unceasingly for each other. Amen.